Uh, subject of this lecture is uh, floquet, which means essentially, let me give a, a plan for the lectures. So, uh, floquet physics is essentially um, studying the dynamics of uh, periodically driven linear systems, okay? Now, <coughs> the linear is important. So, uh, it was in fact originated in classical physics at the end of the 19th century from classical uh, dynamics problem, okay? If you linearize appropriately the motion close to a trajectory, I will explain this later on, you have essentially a system of first order differential equation, which will look like, like this, okay? So x is an n-dimensional vector in the phase space of the problem, and this is the Jacobian, I will tell you more, and you have a linear problem, n-dimensional problem. Now, there are cases where this matrix here is periodic, okay? So it has the following uh, uh, behavior, where T is the period of the problem. And the question is, how do you study if this linear problem is stable or not? It's in some sense the generalization of the small oscillation problems when you do uh, motion close to a minimum hmm, to, to study the... Okay, so this is in the classical case. In the quantum, obviously, the linearity is somehow guaranteed from the start, okay? So the, linear, uh, the, the, the Schrodinger problem is linear, okay? Although, in principle, as you know, is in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space, so this is the extra complication. No? And again, Floquet applies when the Hamiltonian uh, is driven and is periodic in time, okay? So this is the setting. So linearity, either at the by linearizing a classical problem or straight from the more complicated quantum problem and, uh, and periodic behavior. Now, uh, as you see, there is a, a parameter in this periodic motion, which is essentially the period, okay, to which you can associate a frequency, okay, 2 pi over omega, uh, the driving frequency. Obviously, <coughs> there are regimes which you might be interested in looking at. So if this is the frequency axis, and I put here zero and here somehow infinity, mm, so there is a regime that you might call adiabatic, okay? Where the driving frequency uh, goes to zero in some sense, we'll see more. There is a regime that you might call fast driving, Okay, where somehow the frequency is much bigger than any interesting uh, proper frequency of your system at end. And here in the middle, there is a, a land which is interesting and full of things. For instance, your system might have uh, proper frequencies and you expect here resonances, okay? And we'll see that the, uh, even for a simple Too close. Okay, now it's better? Yes. Okay. Um, even for a simple problem like a pendulum, you expect here uh, lots of resonances and this makes life complicated. If you imagine a many-body quantum problem, you could foresee uh, lots of interesting but difficult problems in this in a, a part in between. Okay? Now, uh, I will start, in fact, from very simple a very simple problem, which is the problem of the swing, okay? So as you know very well, uh, you can essentially <coughs> um, oscillate on, in a swing by just, for instance, uh, moving up and down in a concerted way when you go 
forward and backward in such a way as to somehow excite the swing. This is called parametric resonance. Okay? So the parametric resonance is essentially the following. The linearized equation for this pendulum is obviously uh, theta double dot equal to minus omega zero square theta, right? I have here taken theta small, okay? Don't worry for the details, this is just the plan. We'll do things um, later on, okay? Now, this is omega zero being just square root of g over l, where l is the length of the swing. Mm. Now, uh, for instance, if you do uh, move up and down by effectively changing your center of mass and therefore L, what you effectively end up doing is essentially generating here a term that, just to be uh, quick, I would write like this, okay? So your linear problem, as you see, theta is always linear, acquires now a time dependence, hmm? which is periodic, however, okay? So it's in some sense of the class I have written above, where x, okay, now would be a two-dimensional vector, theta, theta dot, right? Hmm? Okay, you can always write it in this way. Hmm? Now, let's, let's think of our experience on the swing. You will remember that the actual resonance that you do when you push yourself up is with a period which is half the natural period because you push when you go forward and when you go backward, okay? Which means that this first driving frequency which somehow makes the system resonate is in fact twice omega zero, okay? T zero is two pi over omega zero, but the way you push is actually every half period. Hmm? So the first frequency is twice omega zero. Hmm? But if you are not, you are a little kid, and it's your father that pushes you, then you would typically do it every period, okay? Every time you are there. Hmm? This would mean omega one equal to twice omega over two. Hmm? So omega zero. And in fact, you can foresee situations where the driving period is arbitrarily a multiple of t over 2. So somehow tn is n times the half period, okay? This suggests that I should expect resonances, okay, when the f driving frequency is twice omega 0 over n, okay? In a while, we will show that this is indeed the case. This is just an argument, but very quite convincing. Okay, okay. so this means if you return to this graph here, that if I have here a proper frequency uh, for my system, which is omega zero, mm, then I have resonances at twice that frequency, which is my omega one, okay? Then I have a resonance here as well, a resonance here at one third, one half, and so, and so, and so, and so, and so forth, okay? So I have an infinite sequence of resonance that, in fact, uh, decorates the adiabatic limit. So, as you see, a very simple thing becomes quite uh, rich of, 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 uh, of resonances. Okay, we'll see this uh, in a while. Now, the next thing that I would like to show, still connected to classical physics, is the problem of dynamical stabilization. Okay, dynamical stabilization is the following phenomenon. Again, look at the swing, but this time consider an inverted pendulum, okay? So, an inverted pendulum is essentially this, okay? You see, I can stabilize it, okay? But I have to do a feedback, okay? Now, I don't want to do that. I'm not an engineer. I would like to do something which doesn't look at the motion, does something and make it stable. Hmm? Can I do it, okay? 
The answer is yes. All you need to do is to oscillate vertically the suspension point, okay? Vertically and not horizontally as I was doing here, okay? Horizontally, if you control, if you measure theta and theta dot, you have a motor and you somehow provide some feedback. I don't want to use any feedback. I just want to oscillate this thing with a certain, uh, say, um, y naught equal to a, for instance, the cosine of omega t, hmm, with a certain frequency, big omega, hmm, and some oscillation fr uh, amplitude a, and I would like to stabilize the uh, pendulum around the vertical position. By the way, this is called the capizza pendulum. Capizza pendulum. Okay? The answer is, yes, you can do it without any feedback. And this is a little movie. So maybe, Filippo, can we switch to the... Is it done? Okay. This is just a... a little YouTube movie. Okay, it's a serious stuff. Harvard Natural Science, no kidding. Okay, so the inverted pendulum is unstable if you don't do anything. Okay, but now you can just stabilize it. Okay. Well, I think there is no need to continue. I mean, it goes on for two minutes, essentially, like this. Uh, now, <clears throat> what? <laughs> Doing things. Right. <laughs> now, there is a, a connected uh, problem, which I will tell you in a second. Never mind, this is a slow motion thing. Uh, just let's, let's quit this, but look at this object. Uh, there is a problem, in, uh, which is a practical problem, if you want to trap ions in, in a lab, okay? Single ions or a few ions. Uh, ions are charged, but you cannot do it by electrostatic potentials alone, because you know that the Laplace equation is Laplacian equals zero, and therefore, for every minimum, there must be some maximum such that the sum of the second derivatives is zero. So there is no stable minimum in electrostatics. But you can play around and with this, the somehow analog of this object, which is a rotating saddle. You will see the mechanical analog of it. So again, the saddle, if you do not rotate it, you put a ball, it's unstable. Hmm? But if you rotate the ball sufficiently fast, okay, then you can stabilize your system. Okay? And this is what people do in the lab to actually trap. It's called Powell trap for ions. Okay? So you put a radio frequency quadrupolar potential on top of some electrostatic uh, unstable system, and the system will be stable and you will trap ions. Okay, so I think we can uh, stop this uh, story here. Okay, so again, <clears throat> the inverted pendulum, you can prove that the equation would be pretty similar to that, to this one, except for a catastrophic plus sign here. So plus omega zero square minus h cosine of omega t theta, okay? So this alone is completely unstable, okay? It's thanks to this that you can stabilize it, okay? So I mean, somehow here, the time dependence uh, excites resonances of an intrinsically stable system. Here, the time dependence is crucial, if sufficiently fast, to stabilize an intrinsically unstable system. Okay, so somehow here, I'm, I'm, in this case, I'm staying here, okay? In this case, I'm staying a little bit in the middle of this region, although in a very simple system, okay? All right, uh, what, what else? Next, this is probably what I will do today. Tomorrow, 
I will switch to the quantum case. So I will show that if you have the Schrodinger problem with a time-dependent periodic Hamiltonian, okay, then first of all, obviously, this is always true. Uh, I can define an evolution operator, okay, a unitary evolution operator that, for instance, takes the state at time zero and evolves it at time t. Mm? Now, if h is periodic, as written there, then you can prove several things, but just to be quick, you can prove that if you want to evolve for an integer number of periods, starting from zero, okay, um, in general, the two times, the, the evolution operator doesn't depend on the difference, okay? In the time-independent case, this is a simple exponential, e to the minus h t over h bar. In the time-dependent case, it's a horrible mess. It's a t-ordered exponential, which I don't even write because it's often very of practical use. Hmm? Uh, uh, sorry, of not too much use, I mean, in, uh, except for perturbation theory type of things. Okay, so you can prove this. You can prove that you can evolve for a single period, okay, and then uh, take a power n of your evolution operator, okay, uh, which is a big advantage because it means, for instance, if you have to do it numerically, you just have to calculate for a, a smaller time and then just apply again your unitary operator n times. Mm? And the second thing that we will show tomorrow is that you can in fact construct a full set of solutions of this problem, okay, so solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger problem, which have the following form, okay. So pretty much as you would do for a time-independent problem, where instead of having the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, here you have periodic functions, periodic states. Okay, so these states are such that uj t plus t equal to uj of t. Okay, so in this form, uh, you probably have somehow encountered this problem when you do the block theorem in solids. Okay, again, the states of an electron in a periodic uh, system do have a periodic part uh, uh, and do have the analog of this that is e to the i k x, the wave vector part, okay? So we will show this in detail and we will discuss several things about Floquet with an application to the simplest probably, uh, somehow the uh, the linear pendulum type of exercise, which is the NMR problem. So you take a large magnetic field along Z, okay? So this is your field along Z on a spin one half problem. And then you put again a kind of radio frequency or microwave on the X and Y. For instance, you can write like this, okay? Now, this problem here is, so these are Pauli matrices, is a spin one-half, time-dependent, periodic, and you can solve it exactly, and uh, this is essentially connected to uh, NMR and the resonances that you use to actually uh, make images of your body, okay? So this is, in fact, what NMR typically does, but this, uh, with the actual other term is exactly solvable, while the linearly polarized case, as we dis will discuss tomorrow, is not exactly solvable. And finally, in the third lecture, or in the, I will discuss, I will discuss how to, in fact, use this device to uh, effectively increase the dimensionality of a problem. Okay, so you can have, and this is a paper by. Martin, Raphael, and Halperin, okay, which is on the archive. I, I, I bet it's published somewhere, but I don't have the reference. 
is 1612.02143, where they show that you take a single spin one half, you subject it to two incommensurate time dependent terms, okay? And by somehow switching to a Fourier lattice type of approach, you effectively have a two dimensional lattice problem, okay? So somehow from a zero dimensional single spin one half, with two incommensurate frequencies, you can somehow engineer hmm, a two-dimensional problem, which obviously has lots of rich physics, okay? And, and playing with that, you somehow can increase the dimensionality and, and play with interesting physics, okay? So I must say that this subject is full of things, so the, the topic that is called Floquet, engineering, topological, floquet, insulator, lots of things. I will be very, very basic, so do not expect fancy applications. But this is essentially the plan of what I would like to do. Okay? So let me start. And in fact, I start with this, with the uh, swing. Okay? Uh, now... <clears throat> me whenever you uh, feel you need, uh, you need uh, help. Okay, now, uh, uh, again, I will consider a resonance in a, in a swing, but I will consider it in the setting in which I oscillate the suspension point, okay, vertically. This is somehow uh, more direct and also uh, allows me to present in a unified manner both the parametric resonance and the Kapitza pendulum in one shot, okay? So, how do you uh, set this problem? It's, it's quite simple. You, for instance, you can write your Lagrangian, okay? This is the x-axis, this is the y. I will call this y0 of t, okay? So, this is, goes up and down, hmm? and obviously the x of t is equal to L, sine of theta of t, and the y of t is equal to y0 of t, the suspension point, minus L cosine of theta of t, okay? Theta is measured from the vertical, and it's positive like this and negative like that, okay? So if you do that, you can calculate your x dot, okay? L theta dot cos theta. I will be quick because this is very trivial algebra, and I don't want to really waste time with that, although, I mean, you have to do it, okay? So the Lagrangian would be um, m over 2 x dot square plus y dot square minus mg y of t, okay? Kinetic energy, potential energy. Hmm? You can do your squares, and you would realize that it comes like this, okay, plus m l y 0 dot theta dot sine theta plus m g l cos theta. And there are two terms which in fact involve um, y0 dot square plus another things that is minus mg y0 and that's it, okay? These are time dependent terms which you don't really need because somehow when you take your Euler-Lagrange equation you take derivative with respect to theta and theta dot. So you can actually drop them, hmm? okay? Then you can calculate the associated momentum, okay? So the L with respect to uh, theta, hmm? And this would be, say, m l square theta dot plus m l y zero dot sine theta, okay? Okay, then you calculate theta dot from here, okay? And you finally write your beloved Hamiltonian. Okay, so the Hamiltonian 
I will write the Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian in the lab frame. Okay? The lab frame is the lab in which you see the suspension point moving. Hmm? Uh, in a second, I will show you how you could write the Hamiltonian in a moving frame in which you are in an elevator in which you don't see that the suspension point is moving, but you feel a non inertial force. Okay? We will do this change in a second. So this uh, lab Hamiltonian would be simply P theta minus L, and it takes very little algebra to show that it has the following form, P theta minus M L, Y not dot sine theta square divided by 2 M L square minus M G L cos theta. Okay? Now, notice the slightly unconventional kinetic term, okay, which contains the suspension point oscillation. Hmm? Okay, now you might say, okay, well, then I have my equation of motion. But I would like you also to consider the fact that, in fact, if you are again uh, considering this point, but in somehow an elevator, Okay, which moves up and down, okay, and you don't see anything, hmm? then inside the elevator, you would say, hey, but I have a g of t, which is changing in time, the acceleration of gravity due to a non-inertial force. And this would be the ordinary g plus, why not, double dot, okay, the acceleration of the suspension point. Hmm? Now, this obviously suggests that in principle I should have a moving frame Hamiltonian which would be P theta square over twice the mass L square minus M G plus Y not double square times L cos theta. Okay? You agree? I mean this would be the G modified by the uh, time dependence inside the thing. Okay, so these are two different Hamiltonians. Obviously, there should be a relationship. Uh, the relationship between these two is a canonical transformation, clearly. Now, if you are a little bit rusty about canonical transformation in classical mechanics, as indeed I am, uh, I suggest the following detour through quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics sometimes, for, it's a bit of a paradox, is simpler for certain things. Uh, the second reason why I do it, not only because I'm rusting classical uh, canonical transformation, is because this will introduce something which will be useful in the, in the following. Okay? So the idea is the following. Uh, to show that these two ways of approaching the problem are equivalent. I start from this, sorry again, and I somehow use this as now, okay, quantum objects. You see, uh, P theta hmm, as a quantum operator would be minus I H bar, the derivative with respect to theta. Hmm. Don't worry about theta itself being not quite uh, well define things because always periodic function of theta appear. Okay? So things are quite well defined. And in fact, you recognize that this momentum is just the angular momentum operator. Okay? Very good. Now, in principle, what Schrodinger tells me that I should solve is this problem. Okay? H lab hmm, of T psi of theta of t. Okay? We agree? This is now the quantum problem associated to this. Notice, it's an infinite dimensional in the sense that this is a function, so it's much more complicated. But uh, for the purpose that I want to do, you see it's uh, very handy. Hmm? Now, how to transform, uh, uh, how to eliminate somehow this ugly piece in the momentum? Well, by a canonical transformation. Suppose that I 
use a unitary operator, which depends on t, in the following way. f of theta t. Okay? Uh, then I want somehow to switch from p theta to u dagger t, the transformed momentum, okay, ut. Now, the transform momentum, if here I have a function of t, hmm, it's a simple calculation, is the momentum itself plus h bar times the derivative of this function. Okay? Essentially because when you take the momentum ap applied to the right, it acts also on this object and brings down the derivative of the function. Okay? With this little device, it's simple to show that the lab Hamiltonian transforms uh, under this unitary operation okay, into the following object. P theta plus H bar F, da, F, F prime of theta and T minus M L Y zero prime times the sine theta square divided by 2 M L square and the rest is untouched because the unitary is only a function of theta and therefore does not affect theta. Okay? It affects only the momentum. So, any suggestion about what is the best F such that this becomes a standard momentum? I guess that you realize that you have to somehow kill these two guys. Okay? So the best thing is to set F such that h bar f prime is equal to m l y zero prime sine theta, okay? But then h bar f of theta should be equal to minus m l y zero prime times the cosine, okay? Remember, this is a derivative with respect to theta, not to time. Hmm? So the, 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 the derivative of the sine Okay, sine is the derivative of the cosine. Hmm? Fantastic. Then you use this and you kill off this object. And somehow your Hamiltonian now has a standard uh, momentum, p square over 2m squared. You might say, okay, I have eliminated completely any reference to y0 prime, which means a, an undriven pendulum. No. No, because the transformation being time dependent, you see, you have to be a bit uh, careful. And here is again something that is very much more general than what I'm doing. Hmm? So I, I, I spend a little bit of time on this. When you uh, transform with a so-called gauge transformation or unitary transformation, a Hamiltonian, and the unitary depends on time, then the Schrodinger equation acquires an extra term. Let's see how this comes about, okay? So this is again general, so I, I, I will set it in this way. So suppose that I have a certain psi of t in the standard representation and I use some unitary operator, okay, uh, in terms of which somehow I can define a transformed state, psi tilde. Hmm? So the goal is to find what is the Schrodinger equation for psi tilde of t. And the uh, algebra is, uh, is pretty simple because when you apply the derivative to this object, again, you have to take care of the derivative here and the derivative there. After essentially one line, I'm, I'm serious, not more than one line, you derive the following thing that in the new transformed setting of psi tilde, the Schrodinger equation will look as follows. We look as u dagger u h u minus i h bar um, 
u dagger t, the derivative t times psi tilde of t. Okay? I don't do the algebra, but I can guarantee it takes very, very little to uh, um, find it. So notice that this is the term that I just evaluated here, but this is the extra term that I do not have to forget. Okay? And if I calculate this term, then what I have to calculate is essentially minus i h bar u dagger, which is e to the minus i f, you see? And then I have to calculate the derivative of this function here, but the derivative now brings down an i, and it brings down also uh, essentially a, a factor which is the cosine and double dot. So if you do the calculation, so of this object, e to the i f, hmm, uh, you will uh, get in the end the extra term which is minus m l y double dot times the cosine of theta. Okay? So the extra term actually gives you the term that you were expecting. Okay? So transforming the Hamiltonian from the lab frame to the moving frame is equivalent to changing from this kinetic, um, uh, somehow unconventional kinetic type of term to a more standard uh, transformation where the uh, driving appears in the potential. Okay? So this is a kind of standard thing which happens, for instance, when you want to change gauge from in the electric field from scalar potential to vector potential is almost the same thing. Okay? Um, so let's... Uh, um, uh, this is essentially what I wanted to, to show because it will be useful uh, later on. Hmm? Now we continue for, for 10 more minutes, I guess, right? So, let me, <clears throat> let me now do the promise of the driven pendulum equation. <clears throat> so, I, I will start again classically, but I will start from this, okay? And I will write my Hamilton's equation. Hmm? So, double dot equal to um, the derivative of h with respect to p theta, mm, which is p theta divided by m l square, okay? And p dot equal to minus d h over d theta, okay? You do the derivative and you find minus m the g. Then I have, I would have here plus y double dot. Now I make a specific choice of this y zero, not, no longer general. I will just select this, okay? So if I take a second derivative, I get minus a omega square, the cosine of omega t times the times, times l times uh, the sine of t, okay? just taking the derivative of that potential term there. Okay, so you can obviously rewrite it as a second order equation. And this would have the following form, the, the thing that I was showing before. So minus omega zero square, where omega zero square is the usual g over l, which you know from the standard um, pendulum, minus omega square a over the length cosine of omega t times uh, times the sine of theta. Okay, never mind. The algebra is one line. Again, I don't do it, but this is the equation for the periodically driven pendulum. Notice it's non-linear. Okay, so as I told you, Floquet cannot say anything about this, okay? 
I have to linearize it. And now I can linearize it close to the bottom position, okay? So when theta is small, okay? And sine theta is close to theta, okay? So I get on one hand the following linearization, which is minus omega zero square minus omega square a over L cosine of omega t hmm? times theta. Okay? Or I can linearize it close to the vertical position. Okay? So I define theta equal to pi plus phi, where phi is a small angle around the vertical. Hmm? And obviously, the sign of pi plus phi is an extra minus sign. And you can immediately show is that the linearized equation this time will have the following look. Okay, is equal to plus omega 0 square minus omega square A over L cosine omega T times phi. Okay? So the two equations are similar except for a crucial minus sign in front. Hmm? And again, this shows that in absence of driving, this inverted pendulum is, as you know, unstable. Hmm? But the two equations are so similar that I would like to write them together. Okay? So I will rewrite them in the following fashion. <clears throat> in fact, let me define a rescale time, which is omega t over 2. Never mind, it's just that, I mean, people, what I'm aiming at is an equation that is called the Mathieu equation, okay? And the standard Mathieu equation, if you look in Wikipedia, whatever you want, has certain rescale parameters, which amount to having essentially this rescaling of the time. Hmm? So you, you just um, rewrite everything and you will find, I will omit the tilde obviously, you will find an equation that has the following look, plus epsilon minus 2h cosine of 2t times theta of t. Okay, the 2 is because of this 2. You see, omega t becomes 2t prime, which I've called t. Okay? Now, this equation here is somehow captures both. In this um, standard pendulum case, the setting is the following. Epsilon is equal to twice omega 0 square, sorry, like this, and h is equal to 2 a over L. Okay? It's, uh, well, it's very simple when you take uh, the rescaling of time and you do a little bit of uh, reshuffling of the constants, you will realize that the constants that go here are exactly these two. Mm? In the other mm, case, you do again the rescaling of time, you do similar algebra, and you find the following, epsilon equal to minus twice omega zero over omega square. And h is essentially the same apart from a sign, which is, however, not very important. Okay? So this is the Mathieu equation for the um, normal pendulum and for the inverted pendulum. Okay? Same equation in a regime of um, parameters, however, that are slightly uh, different. How, how much time do I still have? Five minutes. Okay. Um, yes, in fact, let me just uh, continue a little bit. So, in principle, the next question would be, for what parameters epsilon, where? Of course, yes, I brought 
everything on the left hand side, but this is equal to zero, absolutely. So the question is if I have somehow uh, epsilon and, uh, and, and h as parameters, where is this linear equation stable? Because remember, this is obtained by linearizing a nonlinear problem, which is the pendulum. Okay? So if theta blows up, I have to throw everything away. Hmm? So I have to find parameters uh, in the plane hmm, epsilon h where <clears throat> where somehow <clears throat> uh, the side um, the stability okay so it's a stability diagram plane I have to decide where it is stable and where it is unstable now I'll show to you the diagram which I am somehow alluding at, would be something like this, okay? Okay, so white regions are regions where the Mathieu equation is stable. Dashed regions are regions where the Mathieu equation is unstable. So the theta blows and therefore somehow your pendulum is not stable. So <clears throat> here epsilon, you see, is positive, okay? So I'm really looking at the normal pendulum, okay? So whenever you see white regions, it means that the pendulum can just oscillate and there is no resonance, okay? But you see that even for infinitesimal H, so for infinitesimal uh, shaking, hmm, I can, in fact, become unstable. And notice, it becomes unstable at remarkably simple points. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, which reminds you of squares, huh? or, uh, roughly. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, and we'll see the reason for these squares in a second. Now, look at this small region here. Hmm? Now you see epsilon here is negative. Hmm? which means that I am actually looking at this case, the inverted pendulum case. And you see that there is a tongue of white regions, so stable points, which somehow go in the negative epsilon region. Okay? So this is a region of stability for negative epsilon of the inverted pendulum. Okay? Let me just give you a close-up of this region. You see, I am just looking at negative epsilon, this is the Kapitza pendulum thing. Here it is unstable, here it is again unstable, because remember it's the dash thing, but there is a whole region where you have stability here in the inverted pendulum case. Now, <clears throat> I want to show that this is in disguise a problem that, for instance, if you do condensed matter is a very, very simple thing, which is essentially a particle in a periodic potential, okay? In a cosine potential. So maybe in five minutes I can show the analogy to you. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and between the shaded regions, uh, you can have uh, stability? Uh, you, you mean those lines? Yeah, but they become more and more uh, somehow, I mean, yes. In principle, inside those things, there are very, very narrow, stable things, but I mean, numerically, infinitely hard to... Yeah. You, you mean to go from, from, from here to here? Well, in principle, yes. I mean, this is a, a, a... You see, this is a region where you have... Okay? So there, are, there, are, there, are, there is... A, a contiguous region where you can have solutions for the down pendulum. But obviously, I mean, going from here to here implies a large oscillation, so it's not really a linear problem that you're doing with. Okay? But let me just finish this thing with this analogy, which somehow <coughs> uh, makes this uh, problem very similar to the problem of a block electron. Block electron in a 
periodic potential. Okay? Now, consider the Schrodinger problem. Notice, Schrodinger problem, hmm? not pendulum. Hmm? So, I do have the following thing. So, it is essentially minus h bar square over 2m, the second derivative of psi, okay, plus v of x times psi of x equal to e psi of x. is a Schrodinger uh, eigenvalue problem where this potential here, I take it to be v0 times the cosine of 2 pi x over a. a is a lattice constant. Okay, so in other words, I'm just considering that there is a potential of lattice constant a and of depth somehow related to v0 in which the particle travels. Okay, now I don't want to make the story long. You know that if you don't have this term, then the solution are just free particle problems. So I have essentially that psi of x is e to the i k of x. And I know that the non-interacting uh, solutions are just k square over 2m. Nothing could be simpler, right? Okay. Now, uh, what happens if I what happens if I turn on this potential V0? The following thing, you probably have studied this in other contests, but uh, let me just review quickly for you. <clears throat> now, take this parabolic dispersion. This is the non-interacting parabolic dispersion. Now, unfortunately, now I will have to draw things and I will be very bad in drawing. But uh, <clears throat> you realize that when k is exactly equal to pi over a and minus pi over a, by the way, you remember that there is a reciprocal lattice vector that you can define, which is 2 pi over a, okay? So this is just half of the reciprocal lattice vector, which is called the Brillouin zone of your potential. Mm. Okay, now how much is the, um, the energy at the border of this Brillouin zone of the potential that I'm about to turn on? Well, it is called the recoil energy, okay? You can calculate the recoil energy is just equal to h bar square over twice the mass g over 2, so pi over a square. Okay? You can calculate. Fantastic. So, if I plot e of k in units of the recoil energy, this would be 1. Okay? Now, what do I have to do to actually start setting up this band theory. This is the simplest band theory problem. Hmm? Well, what they teach us in Ashcroft and Mermin or wherever is the following. Hmm. Take the, sorry. Take the unperturbed parabolic band and start folding it inside the brilliant zone by just moving this rigidly, okay, by minus g, minus 2g, where this g is the um, reciprocal lattice vector. Now, you immediately notice that, uh, for instance, at the border of the Brillouin zone, there are two degenerate states. Hmm? And here in the middle, there are also two degenerate states, and so on and so forth. So there are places where this cosine potential will somehow provide a very effective perturbation. And the, sim the, the, the most noticeable thing is this two degenerate states there, which will be, in fact, coupled to first order in perturbation theory, okay? If you do your simple perturbation theory calculation, okay, maybe after the, the break, we will just spend a couple of minutes to discuss this, you would discover that this, in fact, as you turn on 
even the smallest V0, they start being displaced linearly in V0. They open up a gap. Hmm? Now, what is a gap in block theory? A gap is a place where you cannot find block solutions, which means that the formal solutions explode. Hmm? Rather than being oscillatory up to a phase and almost periodic, they actually explode. This is what in solid state is somehow forbidden. They are not solution of your block problem. What are they somehow in the in pendulum case? They are unstable solution of the Mathieu equation. You might say, what has the Mathieu to do with this? Well, it is the same equation, in fact. I could rescale things and transform x into t, psi into the theta of t, so the psi of x somehow becomes, and you see this is the second derivative, this is the cosine, and this is somehow the epsilon term there, okay? So we'll do after the break, because now I think you are a bit tired, but I can show you that the block electron is exactly giving me a Mathieu equation, and the gap of the block problem are precisely the unstable regions of the Mathieu problem, okay? So obviously you can calculate lots of things in perturbation theory here, including the fact that the zero is shifted down to second order in perturbation theory, okay? So in second order in perturbation theory, you would predict that the uh, eigenvalue zero at k equals zero is just shifted down quadratically, and this is the Kapitza pendulum thing. So the fact that the periodic potential actually brings down and uh, uh, there are negative energy solutions when there is a potential, somehow is the Kapitza pendulum problem. So the two, these two seemingly different problems are in fact related, but maybe I stop for 10 minutes, okay? <clears throat> We should move to um, PC. No, Vista Lavagna. Okay. Okay. So let us continue and discuss a little bit more this uh, problem of a block electron in a periodic potential because I have a comment also on this. It can be confusing a little bit. This is a quantum problem. That it was a classical problem. So am I mapping a quantum to a classical? The answer is no. But let's see a little bit more about why do I get a Mathieu equation, okay? So again, the uh, trick is just rescale x, okay? x tilde would be just mm, gx over 2. Remember, g is the reciprocal lattice vector, 2 pi over a. Mm. Then do the change of variables from x to x tilde by rescaling things, and you would essentially transform this equation into the following thing. Um, second derivative of psi with respect to x tilde mm, plus the energy divided by the recoil energy, mm, minus V0 divided by the recoil energy times the cosine of 2x tilde psi of x tilde equal to 0, okay? So it's the same equation, just a bit rearranged. 
in terms of dimensionless things, you know, the energy divided by the recoil energy, the potential divided by the recoil energy. Okay? And now you, know, you uh, immediately see that this is exactly the same Mathieu equation. What I have to identify is this with the parameter epsilon and this with the parameter 2h. Okay? And obviously call x tilde t and psi uh, theta. Okay? So somehow psi of x tilde is playing the role of theta of rescale time, which I would call t there. No? So I transformed a second order linear differential equation, which describes a block electron in a solid, into a second order linear differential equation, which describes a driven pendulum. Okay? This is not a quantum to a classical mapping. This is really differential equation linear. If I had to study the quantum version of the pendulum, it would be quite a complicated problem because remember that I have to make the momentum P to be a, an operator minus I h bar the derivative. And I should study, according to the prescription there, the Schrodinger equation where I have a psi of theta and t, which is a much more complicated problem. And plus, I mean, in principle, there I linearize my problem where in the pendulum I have a nonlinear term, which when you quantize becomes just a nonlinear potential. And you can do the full quantum linear, uh, full quantum pendulum there. So somehow this uh, correspondence shouldn't uh, make you think that I'm here making a correspondence between classical and quantum. I'm simply identifying uh, two problems which have a, a very similar equation, okay? But the identification is useful because somehow you know how to do perturbation theory in this uh, simple Schrodinger problem, okay? So if I ask you, please calculate the corrections to the band to lowest order in the potential V, then you set up your perturbation theory calculation and you know how to answer things. If I ask you, please do perturbation theory in the uh, driving for the Mathieu equation, you say, perturbation theory, what should I do? Well, it's the same problem, okay? So, in principle, for instance, suppose that I ask you, what about this point here, okay? This is the constant wave function in infinite space and has energy zero, remember? The waves are this, and the energies are h bar square k square over 2m, right? For k equals zero, zero energy. What if I turn on the potential? What happens to this eigenvalue? The answer is it goes down. Second order perturbation theory always pulls things down. Hmm? And you can calculate. You can calculate that this goes down, okay, with the correction that is minus in this uh, framework in which I have this object here, I think it's minus, uh, let me just give you the, the thing, minus h bar, h square over 2m, where h is this, um, so 2h is v0 over this, okay? This is the part of h. This means that, for instance, you can immediately tell me that, indeed, this line hmm, is, in second order perturbation theory, minus h bar square over 2. You can check for h equal to 1, it's close to minus 0.5. Okay? So it's, I mean, you would calculate it with a one-minute calculation. And the identification of the parameters tell me the following thing. If epsilon, which is the inverted pendulum parameter, which is a minus sign here, is inside that region, the pendulum is stable, okay? Shall we see what is the omega such that the pendulum is stable? Of course, what you have to do is the following. You have to... <clears throat> 
you have to impose that epsilon, which is minus 4 omega 0 square divided by omega square, okay? So this is the epsilon of the Capizza pendulum, okay? Should be greater than minus h square over 2, which is the, the, by how much the zero eigenvalue is pulled down as you turn on h. Hmm? So this is the condition for ending into this region here for given h. And now you can just solve and find that you just have to make omega sufficiently large, greater than 2 square root of 2 omega 0 over h. h, recall, is related to the um, uh, in the pendulum to uh, a over the length, okay? So I rewrite in terms of these physical things, 2, sorry, omega 0, L over A, okay? So if the frequency with which you drive the pendulum is greater than this physical combination, which is the natural frequency, the length, and the oscillation amplitude, then the pendulum is stable, okay? And if you do it with your, um, uh, how, how do you call it, the, 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 the thing to cut the wood, okay? Like in the, in the YouTube video, okay? You could, in principle, try to uh, make the frequency change, and at a certain point, if the frequency is too small, the, 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 the pendulum is unstable, okay? So it has to oscillate sufficiently fast that somehow this epsilon is negative but small enough to enter here. If it is negative and too large, too large and negative would be unstable, okay? So this is the uh, condition for stability. Um, now, um, the rest of this lecture is um, a bit to try to justify how, in general, in classical uh, mechanics, you uh, linearize things, okay? So just a, a brief uh, somehow generalization of this pendulum thing. Any other questions uh, concerning this, this, this little exercise so far? By the way, there are uh, problems suggested in the lecture notes that I can discuss with you if you want to somehow try to understand better things. Um, but now let me just <clears throat> uh, move to a bit of Floquet-Lyapunov theory, which somehow <clears throat> makes the story a little bit more general. So still classical. So suppose that I have a problem with a certain n-dimensional phase space, okay, which I draw obviously just a, a simple three-dimensional things, and I have a certain phase space point x, okay, and a flow which is x dot equal to some nonlinear function of the position f and t, okay? I can essentially write any Hamiltonian flow or even dissipative flow into a first order in time, but possibly nonlinear problem in phase space like this, okay? Uh, now, suppose that I have a certain trajectory, okay, which I will call x0 of t, okay? It's a reference trajectory of some motion. Hmm? And I want to study the stability of this trajectory to small perturbation, okay? So suppose that this starts from some point x0, okay? And I just perturb a little bit the initial condition uh, at time t0 by some small vector w0, okay? Now, the end result is a new close by initial condition. And I would like to know if this thing will do like this and therefore will maintain somehow small the distance or will do like this. How do I do that? Well, in principle, what you do is the following. <clears throat> you just say, okay, let me study x minus the reference trajectory 
Okay? So I will call this object W of t is the somehow the, the distance at time t okay, between the trajectory uh, starting from a slightly different point and the reference trajectory x0. Okay? So if I start from w equal to 0, huh, then I follow this. Then I perturb a little bit, I follow something else. And I want to know what is the something else. Okay? Fantastic. Then I just uh, rewrite this problem by just making this substitution. Therefore, I calculate x i dot, okay, let me write it here, x i dot is equal to x dot of the reference trajectory, this is the i component, plus w i dot, okay, the deviation w, w is the deviation. This should be equal to the i component of the flow field, huh? f, is the setting clear? Okay. The i component of this object calculated at x0 of t plus w of t, t. Um, okay. This is still uh, just uh, um, substitution. Now we expand this in the w. Hmm? Suppose that obviously I keep only the linear order term. So for w equals 0, I have fi of x0 of t, t. And then I have the linear order term, which is sum over j of the derivative of fi with respect to the xj calculated at the unperturbed point, okay, times w, j, of t plus dots, higher order in w, okay? Is it clear? Now, my assumption x naught is a reference trajectory, so it satisfies x naught dot equal to f of x naught t, okay? Which means that these two terms actually cancel each other, okay? And now you see immediately that the linearized equation, so by disregarding the dot, involves, in fact, this object here, which is a matrix. It's, in fact, the Jacobian of the force field, which I will call, well, to remind you that this is a Jacobian, J, I, J, I component with respect to the J thing, and obviously, it's a function of time in general, because I am actually linearizing, in principle, close to some time-dependent trajectory, or the force field also might be time-dependent. Okay? So, to conclude, the linearization seems to suggest that what I have to study is the following problem. W dot of T equal to j of t dot w of t, and I completely neglect any other thing. So I have reduced myself to studying linear problem. I want to know if the w that satisfies this equation blows or not. This is the setting. Hmm? If it blows, it means that somehow the trajectory is not stable, if it doesn't blow, then somehow the trajectory, the reference trajectory is a stable, attracting trajectory, okay? And there is a lot of literature, as you understand here, there is a Lyapunov exponent that you can define and so forth. I don't want to enter into that. I want to just focus on the Floquet aspect of the story. In fact, Floquet, I think, invented the, the, the story in Lyapunov to study the stability of periodic orbits. You have a periodic orbit in classical mechanics and you want to know how stable it is. So you want to do the analog of what you do when you study the stability close to a minimum or a maximum of a, just a, a small oscillation problems in mechanics uh, with respect to orbits. And uh, the problem that uh, they were considering is linear differential equations 
where this j of t is periodic, okay? So let's see when this comes about. It comes about in essentially two possible cases, well, among the others. So the first possible situation is the following. Your F, you have an autonomous system, so the, the, the F doesn't depend on time, okay? But X0, the reference trajectory, is periodic. Okay? Then, you notice immediately, this object here, the derivative of fi with respect to xj, calculated at the reference trajectory, which is by definition your Jacobian, is periodic. Okay? The second possibility, so this is the first. The second possibility is the following. x0 is a point. Okay? It's just a point in phase space. But somehow you drive your system in such a way that your flow is time dependent. You are doing something, like in our pendulum case. Okay? So I want to know, is the position of the pendulum, for instance, uh, close to the, the bottom, to, 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 the, to, the, to the vertical, stable or not? Okay? So I consider the x0 equal to down, and I ask myself what is the equation okay, for the motion when I linearize. This is what we did for the pendulum already. Okay? So again, in this case, the j, okay, which is essentially the derivative of fi with respect to xj, now calculated at a fixed point, but with time t, and the periodic driving, again, a periodic matrix, okay? So essentially linear problems with periodic coefficients uh, arise by linearizing classical mechanics problem either around periodic orbits or by periodic driving close to minima of the solutions, okay? Now, uh, what we will uh, show tomorrow is that this type of problem, like in the Schrodinger quantum problem, uh, allow you to say a lot about the structure of the solutions and the stability in this case of the solution. In, notice, in the quantum Schrodinger problem, there is no question of stability because somehow the evolution operator is unitary, okay? So it conserves the norm. So things do not, never blow up in Hilbert space. In this case, there is an issue related to the blowing up of things. So in fact, the evolution operator is not unitary and you have to watch if somehow it has eigenvalue with modulus in complex plane greater than one that somehow make the solution blow, okay? But what we will do tomorrow, and maybe starting, <clears throat> yeah, I guess starting tomorrow, <clears throat> is the following, is to show that the solutions of this problem here, so W dot equal to J of t, w, t, okay, where this is periodic, okay, can be classified as follows. They somehow can be written as follows. There are a basis set of solutions, linear independent solutions, that have the following form t minus t0 times uj of t, where uj of t is periodic. So uj of t plus t is equal to uj of t. Okay? You recognize something very similar to what I told you in the introduction about 
what the Floquet theorem in the quantum case tells us. Except that in that case, here, hmm, I was writing psi j of t equal to e to the minus i epsilon j t over h bar uh, times u j of t. Hmm? Now, this is a phase, okay? Now, it's not a phase. It's, in general, a complex number. Hmm? And therefore, uh, but, but the, the periodic part is somehow the same, hmm? formally. Now, the, the, the whole question is, therefore, uh, about stability is that the system is unstable <clears throat> whenever this lambda j have a real part that is greater than zero, okay? So the condition for which somehow an object like this with a part that is periodic and the part that is exponential is stable is that the exponential part would in principle have some imaginary part which provides oscillation, but the important part is the real part of lambda. If the real part is positive, it blows up. If the real part is non-positive, then it's stable. Okay? So you might say, okay, what should I do to calculate the lambda of my linearized problem when I have periodic? It turns out that there is a very simple uh, object that you have to look at. And the object to look at is the evolution operator for one period again. So the crucial thing to look at is the following. <clears throat> Let me set this up. <clears throat> again, proofs will be given tomorrow as somehow, I mean, very similar to the quantum case. I will illustrate the two. Uh, one uh, close to the other to show you the similarity. Mm. So the uh, idea is the following. Uh, this is an n-dimensional n-dimensional problem and I can find uh, n linearly independent solutions. For, first of all, okay? This perhaps does not surprise you. How do you find it? Just take n initial vector at time t0, okay, which are linearly independent, okay, evolve it in time with the linear equation, and out of this object, you will have n solutions, and you are guaranteed that these are still linearly independent. You might ask how it comes, hmm? how, how to prove this. Well, <clears throat> it can be proved in a, with an argument, with a, in fact, it's a proof, which I will tell you in a second. But first of all, let me just assume that this is true. Then I can organize these objects here as uh, a big matrix W, okay, which contains in the first column uh, w1, okay, here, in the second column w2, okay, and so forth, up to wn, okay? So rather than working with vectors, I work with n by n matrix made by n columns, which are the n linearly independent solutions of my problem, okay? Obviously, <clears throat> If I have that each vector satisfies this, then you can write that the W prime is just related to the matrix itself by a very similar equation. Now, however, this is a matrix n by n, n by n, n by n. Okay? So I have transformed my vector matrix vector problem into a matrix 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 problem. Mm? Now, this is, in principle, the equation that you need to solve. Now, why you are guaranteed that linearly independent vectors do remain linearly independent? Because somehow there is an identity that is called the Jacobi identity that tells you that if I take a derivative of the 
determinant of this matrix W of T, then this object satisfies a, a simple differential equation, which is the trace of J times the derivative of W itself. Okay? So somehow, if the initial uh, determinant formed by the initial conditions is different from zero because by definition you take linearly independent initial vectors, then you are guaranteed by this equation that the linear independence is preserved. In fact, you can integrate this and deduce very simply that the... Uh, yeah. These are n solutions of this equation, okay? Notice these are vectors, okay? Eh? At time t, this is a differential equation in time. Is it, is it clear? No. I mean, remember the, the pendulum thing? Uh, I have t, uh, theta dot at time t equal to, or theta double dot, because uh, equal to something theta of t with something that depends on t, okay? So it's, t is the same here. This is not a propagator thing. It's a, just a differential equation. So how the w changes at time t, okay? Maybe I, uh, I mean, it comes from here. Here, there is T and T, okay? Same time. Is it clear to almost everybody? Maybe, maybe I should just uh, uh, re re revise for, for, yeah. But it, it just means that we can decompose any initial starting point and then... It essentially means that if we have linearly independent things, the linear independence cannot be lost because, I mean, the, the trajectories cannot really, uh, I mean, there is... A, a, uniqueness theorem that they, they cannot intersect. Okay, so they, bec they remain linearly independent. Hmm? Now, why is this useful? It is useful because I can now define hmm, a propagator pretty much like when you do uh, quantum mechanics. Okay, so I can define uh, the matrix W hmm, at time t, since it is related by a linear equation, will be related by a propagator to the matrix at time t0. Okay? This is the propagator of this equation. Okay? Because the equation is linear, I can write a linear equation like this, which transforms the initial condition into the condition at time t, okay? Now, as we will show tomorrow, again, the crucial point is the propagator over one period. So if I go from t0 to t0 plus t, okay, I transform this into the initial condition to the condition at time t, okay? This one period propagator, okay, is the crucial object in the story. We will see it tomorrow. And all you need to do is to find the eigenvalues of this object. So I will find the eigenvalues of this object, okay, times some uj t0 and somehow mu j uj t0. Okay, so if I find the eigenvalues and associated eigenvectors, I have essentially solved the Floquet problem, okay? 
And the crucial aspect of the story is that these eigenvalues are in general complex, okay? So I have a real part of mu and an imaginary part of mu. And if I am outside of the unit circle, okay? So I'm here, then the system is unstable because as you keep applying the one period uh, propagation, the system blows up, okay? You might ask, why now you are using mu and not this lambda? They are connected, in fact. We will see tomorrow that the lambda j is essentially one over the period, the logarithm of mu j, okay? So whenever the mu j are complex end greater than one in modulus, the real part of the lambda that appears here is positive and therefore it blows up. Hmm? Now, <clears throat> so all this we'll see tomorrow. This is just an unpaid debt that I have with you. Uh, don't worry if uh, things are not uh, completely clear. It's enough if you remember that linearizing a classical problem, we are uh, led to a linear problem with periodic matrix coefficient. This is crucial to tomorrow discussion, but maybe to end today um, story, <clears throat> let me just do as an illustration uh, the Mathieu problem, what you would do for the Mathieu problem. <clears throat> so I define the deviation to be theta and theta dot, okay? Remember that I want first order differential equation, so I have a two-dimensional uh, space that I can work with, and I can uh, show you immediately from the Mathieu equation that the corresponding problem is the following. W dot equal to zero, one, 2h cosine 2t minus epsilon 0 w okay let's see why this is the case you see uh, here I have uh, theta dot theta double dot okay and here I have what well theta theta w, okay? So you see, this is the first equation tells me that theta dot is equal to theta dot, okay? What else? The second equation tells me that theta double dot is equal to this coefficient here times theta plus zero times theta dot. And in fact, this is what you have here, okay? You see? Is is too fast? Which one? Which one? This is a little bit, uh, yeah. In fact, in the notes, you will find it very clearly because the matrices are big and the vectors are uh, small, but on the board, become a little bit confusing. But in some sense, the questions are exactly the same. So, just a vector. Uh, equation into corresponding with all. So you are right, however. I should probably use. Okay. So yeah. Uh, in any case, is is this uh, um, is this clear? Okay. So you can write the Mathieu equation there exactly in the form that I am suggesting here, hmm, where the matrix J is this two by two object here. Okay. And now, uh, as you see, this matrix is periodic. Uh, periodic in time with the time, which, by the way, uh, I have rescaled. Huh? I have rescaled, remember, here. Okay, now, <clears throat> um, what about the trace of J? Okay, the trace of J is equal to zero. Okay? 
Now, if you recall the Jacobi identity, I unfortunately erased it. I told you that the determinant of W at time t is equal to the determinant of W at time t0 times e to the integral from t0 to t of the trace of j t prime. In fact, I didn't write the solution. I wrote, I wrote the differential equation. Remember, the derivative with respect to time of the determinant of w of t equal to the trace times w of t. Remember? The trace of j of t times the determinant of w of t. Okay? These are the matrices. Okay? So that I can take a determinant. So this is the Jacobi identity, I integrate this. But now, <clears throat> if the trace of j is equal to zero, I, all I have is that the determinant is unchanged as the system evolves, okay? Good, so how do I obtain the evolution operator over one period? All I need to do is to start from a matrix W, which is the identity, okay? Notice, I take here a matrix that is the identity, which is so 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 0, 0, 0, okay? Uh, and I evolve it for a one period, obtaining a solution at time t, which is the period. In principle, if I start from the identity, the final solution is the operator over one period, which is what I need to study the spectrum of it. Hmm? Now, in the following, in this case here, if I start from the identity, which means determinant equal to one, the determinant is unchanged because the trace is zero, which means that the solutions will always have determinant one. Uh, good, but if the determinant is one, there are only two possibilities. It's a two by two matrix of determinant one, okay? There are essentially two possibilities. One is that the two eigenvalues produce one. So one is equal to e to the i sum mu t equal to mu two star. Okay? So that the product of the two, remember, the product of the two, um, uh, the determinant of this uh, evolution operator here uh, is equal to the product of the two eigenvalues, mu1 times mu2. It should be equal to 1, means that the two are just complex conjugate unit length objects, and this is one case, obviously this is a stable case. You realize that I, I, at each period I multiply the solution by just the modulus one phase, which means that things oscillate. Essentially. Or, <clears throat> mu one is for instance less than one in modulus, but then since the product of two has to be one, so the modulus of the determinant is the product of the modula. Hmm? Uh, there must be one which is greater than one. Okay? So whenever one is less than one, the second is outside of the unit circle, and this is an unstable situation. Okay? So this is just to say that in principle, to study the stability of this problem, all you need to do is to integrate for one period this two by two uh, problem hmm? and find the two eigenvalues of the evolution operators. As long as they somehow are complex conjugate phases, then things are stable. As one starts to be less than one and the other starts to be greater than one, then uh, the system is unstable. Okay? So this is in principle what you would need to do Yeah. 
there are initial conditions, in principle, carefully chosen initial conditions would go to zero. But as, long, as soon as you add a little bit of the unstable uh, direction, it blows. Okay? So, unfortunately, it's a very unstable thing that you have to. Once there is an unstable direction, I mean, there is no way of eliminating it, essentially. Numerically, sooner or later, we'll get a little bit of it, and then things will blow up. Okay? So the only really stable situation is where the two eigenvalues are modulus 1 and complex conjugate. Okay. <clears throat> I think, roughly speaking, is, uh, this is kind of the um, first um, classical type of uh, uh, warm-up uh, exercise on flow K problems. So tomorrow we will um, uh, see these things uh, in a much more formal uh, way. So we will uh, prove the Floquet theorem for quantum and the classical case and discuss uh, applications to quantum problems. But I wanted to start from somehow simple and intuitive driven classical problems to, to in fact, uh, start from where the whole thing started from. So Floquet uh, invented it in classical physics. And I think that this is, this is the end. I would stop here for today. Is it, is it okay or there is still okay? Because I think people are tired. Thank you. Yeah.